Okay, here we are. So um, what do you want as far as bees are concerned? Th these, these are, uh, we took 180 hives down about three weeks ago now, maybe two and a half weeks ago to California. We've been doing this the last few years. Um, and I, I'll talk about kind of why we started doing it. But part of it was the season here is so short in Northern Idaho and Eastern Washington, as far as breeding, we, we can't really make queens until about June. And sometimes we can't really get in our hives until April. So by taking a lot of our stock down to California, we can kind of get in them. We can uh, begin to make some assessments and I'll talk about that later, but this was taken at about 5.30 today out this out my driveway. And uh, these, are, these are some of our uh, Caucasian breeder queens. So these are uh, queens derived from semen that we brought in from the country of Georgia, the Caucasus Mountains. Um, let's see, okay, right, anyway, so yeah, so that's, so we do, you know, what I like to say is those also serve who stay home and live through the winter. The others are down in California now, they, you know, we fed them and they're getting to feed on mustard and things like that. And meanwhile, their sisters are up here. Okay, uh, and I, this, this, is, there's about three slides here and it weirdly uh, uh, you, is using this, they, they were um, a, a different format. Uh, I just wanted to kind of let you know what's going on in the lab. So um, we do we do several sorts of work on colony health, uh, and you've heard from I think Nick Nager on the polypore mushroom extracts, and that is fairly close to receiving AFCO certification and hopefully FDA approval as a feeding additive, and uh, I think Nick talked a lot about that. Uh, the metarhizium. This is um, this is a fungus that, for the last two years, Jennifer Hahn and um, the lab has been selecting for um, for um, as a biocontrol agent against varroa mites. And this is normally a soil dwelling uh, fungus, and it can't stand high temperatures. But she has done regular good old fashioned selection for survival at high temperatures. And we have gone through many generations of, of um, growing the fungus from the dead bodies of Varroa mite. So we've continually increased uh, virulence in this strain of metarhizium. And uh, we're pretty, that, that's pretty exciting. We're gonna be doing some large scale field tests this year. Uh, Brandon Hopkins and his students have been working on uh, indoor storage and uh, more recently on some queen banking. I, I won't talk about any of this unless you want to hear about it later. Um, the um, germplasm cryopreservation that I will talk about some. Brandon has a student um, who's working on trying to make improvements in that. Whoops, I don't know what happened to my thing here. Don't really know how to work this apparently. Um, and then finally, the uh, I have a PhD student, Kirsten Ritchie, and uh, she has a very interesting project. I think it's very interesting, looking at uh, asymmetrical sperm survival uh, in uh, in the honeybee queen. If you think about this, unlike any other animal, the honeybee queen has a spermatheca and keeps sperm alive for you know several years, possibly uh, inside her body. And that's pretty unusual in the animal world for sperm. And so uh, that also leads to the potential for there to be uh, natural selection, you know, and basically evolution at that very basic level. Okay. And then the, the, the uh, other long term, and this is what I'm really talking about today, you know, it has to do with our uh, importation and distribution of honeybee germplasm. And it comes from my original training as a population geneticist and my, my interest in diversity in the honeybee. And the uh, New World Carniolan Program, some of you know about that. It's a long, something that Stu Kobe has been doing for about 
three and a half decades. And it's, um, she's uh, gone through a number of universities, you know, with this program, Ohio State, University of California at Davis, and now Washington State. And the long-term prospect for this is to move it into the hands of uh, the beekeeping industry. And so beginning in 2021, the actual breeder queens for New World Carniolans will come from a, a couple of collaborating queen producers from California. Okay. And so these are the pictures of these people. Uh, here's Nick Nager. This was uh, a nice uh, uh, fungus that we found uh, this, this year. Uh, this is Jennifer Hahn. This is Brandon Hopkins. Uh, this was in France in 2019. I'll talk about that trip a little bit. And then I think over here is Stu Kobe. I can't see because, wait, let me get rid of you. Ah, because of all the pictures of people. And there's Stu Kobe. So, all right. Anyway, why can't I go on? Okay, here is, here's the actual talk with the, the use of cryopreserved germplasm. I have no idea now, Jerry, why I put that as a possible title, but <laughs> I will talk about it, but it's it's not mostly what I'm going to talk about. So I don't know why I put it in there. But if you want me to only talk about cryopreserved germplasm, I will. But instead, this is what I'm kind of intending on talking about. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the history of, of breeding that we've done at WSU, kind of how it got started, and which leads up to kind of how it where it is now. Um, the middle part of this will then be instrumental insemination and the technology that Brandon brought. Brandon was a PhD student in my laboratory. And uh, as part of his project, he basically figured out how to do um, crowd preservation of honeybee semen in a way where it was still functional to use for uh, uh, breeding purposes for the, for the purpose of getting the genetics back out of the liquid nitrogen. Uh, it is, you know, you cannot take a virgin queen and inseminate her with previously frozen cryopreserved honeybee semen and then have her head a normal, wonderful colony uh, because uh, there is cryogenic damage to the sperm. You, the best you can hope for normally is that she will lay eggs that develop into workers and that you can graft and make queens for a few months. If you get that out of her, you're, you're pretty good. And we usually keep them in kind of small colonies so they don't, you know, use everything up. You know, if you're making another human or a cow, you just need one good sperm and you get another human, right, or another cow. So the bar is much lower to make people or cows than it is for a queen to have a colony with tens of thousands of viable workers. So uh, we've kind of figured that out. Brandon uh, and his students are, are working to improve things, but the, the main point for my, the main thing that we like is the fact that we can now use it for breeding purposes. And then the final thing I was going to talk about uh, some of the distributions of this. You know, I have to say it is a bit odd because I'm only looking at my screen. But can you you guys can see my screen? Can you also see me? Which might be a bad thing. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. All right. All right thanks. Uh, so I won't do weird things with my face then. Okay. Um, yeah. So within this genus A. This, as most of you may know, it, it's a pretty diverse genus. Uh, there are 10 to 12, maybe 15 species. It depends on how you split or lump species of honeybees. You know, the dwarf honeybees, Apis florea, in that group, the giant honeybees, Apis dorsata, in that group. There are a number of species in each of those groups. Apis serrana, the eastern hive bee. Uh, and then Apis mofer, the Western honeybee. Um, these, uh, none of these are native to the New World, right? Um, instead, Apis mellifera, the one that we all know and love here, um, is allopatric, meaning 
it did not have a natural zone of overlap that we know of with the rest of the genus. So all those other species, 12 to 14 species of, of hive bees that have multiple combs in a cavity or single giant combs, you know, either on rock cliffs in Nepal or on trees in Vietnam, uh, or the little dwarf honeybee that's, you know, and palm trees in Thailand and in India. Uh, none of those occur sympatrically or in the same locations as Apis mellifera. So that itself is a bit of a weird quandary. And that led to, um, it's led to a number of things, but one thing it's led to is for us to look more in this region uh, of the world. Um, and we did this mainly in the early 90s. Uh, we could, of course, could not go into Afghanistan, although people did go there later. But um, we, were, we went to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and things like that. And that's where we found the new subspecies. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But the, the story on this diversity on this one species with a huge range that includes Scandinavia to South Africa uh, is sort of the diversity that we now see in it. So during the Pleistocene, during the ice ages, the, the honeybee was restricted into you know, the Southern Europe into different refugia. So so say the honeybees, or you know, we'll call them proto honeybees of that were here in um, in the Ligurian Peninsula, you know, in Italy, they were separated from these other guys. They did not really have gene flow, and they accumulated genetic differences. And then as the glaciers retreated, uh, these things, you know, expanded up, say, to the Alps here in in Italy and various. Uh, the Ural Mountains in, um, in Russia for the dark bee, Apis mellifera mellifera of uh, Northern Europe. So, so that, that's what we now look at as sort of the explanation for the diversity in Europe. The diversity in Africa is a different story related to, they didn't have glaciers, but they had a lot of drying and, and uh, uh, changes in vegetation over time. Uh, a lot of this hasn't been well studied. It's been well studied in other systems. And we're beginning to realize, you know, some of this distribution follows a pattern in other, uh, that other animals have. But one of the things that was evident, you know, even during the times of the ancient Greeks was that, hey, there are differences in these bees. You know, some of them are yellow and these are not yellow and, you know, there are all kinds of different things. And, ah, right, that is not a honeybee. That's not a bee. But um, um, so people were aware of these differences, but it was kind of, uh, they didn't really know much what to make of it, even though Aristotle wrote about it. I'll, I'll say that. But, but really in the 1800s, with the development of morphometrics, you know, the idea to measure things and, and, you know, write it down and then sort of look at things and try to classify things. People um, classify the, the honeybee right now into about 28 recognized subspecies. And I'll talk a little bit about that and we won't continue, you know, belabor it. But um, subspecies, um, you know, in other animals, it's it's used a lot, especially in birds or, or things where people, they see that there's one species, there's maybe interbreeding even in nature, but they, they seem to be different and they want them to be different. So uh, in entomology, because we have a million described insects, there are papers written in the 1950s or so where there's a lot, people frown on subspecies in insects, I'll just tell you in general, because it's a warm and fuzzy thing. You know, species, you can say, okay, they don't naturally or normally interbreed. Um, we know that, that none of that is true anymore based on, uh, you know, for plants and all. A lot of our thinking on speciation comes from the fact that, that there were animal people that kind of uh, wrote some of that 
wrote some of the book on it, and they ignored what the plant people were telling them, even though the plant people were right. But the honeybee, we, we claim an exemption a little bit because uh, one of the uses of subspecies is it allows you to know what you're talking about. You know, that you, that you they, they, these, these things, you know, the honeybees, the honeybee of Northern Europe is quite, quite different than the honeybee that's restricted to the Nile River Valley. You know, this, the Apis mellifera lamarckii, that one that you saw with the, the, the woman taking it out of a small uh, mud tube, they're about two thirds the size of the European honeybee. They have very, very different behaviors. And so it's useful for us to keep this subspecific name. So that word trinomial is used uh, for that. So Apis mellifera lagustica is a honeybee of, of the Ligurian Peninsula. Apis mellifera rutneri is a honeybee that we describe from Malta, the little island of Malta, believe it or not. But originally these Germans and Russians figured out that you could measure things. And so if we take even just the length of the forewing, and these three sort of well-known subspecies, Apis mellifera mellifera, you know, the dark bee of Northern Europe, Apis mellifera meta from, from Turkey, Apis mellifera yemenitica from uh, Yemen, Northeastern Africa. These things can be separated by just the length of their forewings. Uh, but because remember there are 28 of them. So if you were to put all the subspecies in here, it'd be a big mismatch, mishmash. So, uh, morphometricians back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, computers came along. Wow, now it's great. We're doing discriminant analysis. Um, measured all these things and, and came up with a fairly robust classification of subspecies. The guy that did most of this work was a guy named Friedrich Rutner, and he also called them geographic races because they're usually related to geographically different locations. And one thing that you should be aware of, just the last thing on this, and we'll get away from this, is that even within a subspecies, there are um, ecotypes. So there are things that are quite different. So Apis mellifera mellifera, the dark bee of Northern Europe, uh, includes some locally well-known things like the Leylon bee from Southwestern France that my student Jamie Strange worked on, or it's very similar to the heather bee of, say, Scotland or Scandinavia. These bees are so adapted to heather that if you move them 400 you know, kilometers away to Paris from Leylon, they, they'll starve to death because their, um, their annual cycle is kind of adapted to getting a giant honey flow in September that shuts the queen down and they go through the winter and everybody's happy. You take them to Paris and they don't gather enough food during June, which is when they need to do it in Paris, and uh, then they starve to death. So, okay, anyway, so uh, that's sort of the story about the classification of honeybees. And uh, the one thing to take is to remember is that this idea of subspecies is kind of agreement among observers, right? There's not quite the scientific rigor that you might think that scientists like to have. But we, we do know that a number of subspecies were brought to the New World. The first record we have is this dark bee of Northern Europe, you know, from England. In 1622, it was in Virginia. Uh, it was only went, went around for about 100 and, or 237 years, I think, because it wasn't until the 18, 1859 that the Italian honeybee was brought to the US. And between 1859 and 1922, a huge amount, well, seven or eight other subspecies were brought. One reason that so that no one, that once you got the honeybee here that people didn't bring others is it was so expensive and so difficult to get them to survive on the sailing ship. But by the mid 1800s, we had steamship assi or steam assisted uh, shipping. And, uh, you know, it suddenly was only two weeks or so to go from England to the U.S. Um, 1877 was our first record of the Carniolan honeybee being brought in. They were mainly brought into uh, 
Canada, actually, at that time. So this is just a list based on historical records of different subspecies and when they were introduced to the New World. The main reason for showing this is this is sort of the genetic background of the feral bees we had in this country, you know, up until varroa mites anyway. Um, I mean, the last two, you know, Scutellata and Pomanella, we can kind of not think about too much, but um, uh, some of my early work for my PhD and some of my early students uh, demonstrated genetic markers of these subspecies were present in uh, the US wild populations of honeybees. <clears throat> Whether that's true now or not is problematic because of varroa mites. Uh, in 1922, the US Honeybee Act was passed and that restricted further importation of honeybees in the US. And it was an attempt back then to keep out the tracheal mite, you know, that caused the Isle of Wight disease that people had uh, really discovered the causative agent in 1921. So in that particular case, Congress acted pretty fast. And some would say at the time, a little bit hasty, but yeah, that law and variations of it are still in effect. So when we go to Europe, um, we're unable to bring back, you know, Italian honeybees or Carniolan honeybees into the U.S. So we, we, we have a permit to bring semen back. I know you're thinking of the, well, what about all these bees they brought in from New Zealand and Australia? Well, that was a political decision outside of uh, the APHIS, outside of these regulations and um, uh, a bit short-lived. Um, so we won't say much more about that. The, the one issue when they brought the, those, those bees from there is of course, they did not have, have tracheal mites, right? At that time. And we had had tracheal mites since 1984. So then when they started bringing in, you know, 20 something years later, a bunch of bees from Australia that were not, had not been exposed to them. The idea being that they, uh, we're probably highly susceptible to tracheomite. Anyway, okay, that's a little background. Are there any questions on that? Um, 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 okay, so hearing none and not seeing anyone, I will just motor on. So uh, in this next part, I'm going to go through really fast. I almost took all these slides out, but then I thought I it, it, maybe it would be interesting. This is Smoot Hill. Uh, those are wheat fields across from it. Behind us, if we were if you were to look behind the person taking the picture, that was me. You would see um, another bit of kind of high ground like this. This, um, for those of you that don't know it, Eastern Washington, we have Steptoe Butte, Kamiak Butte, which is over here, and then this place um, called Smoot Hill. These are actually granitic outcrops of the western edge of the North American plate. Everything west of here, and this is, remember, eastern Washington, about 10 miles from Idaho, everything west of there to the ocean is relatively new stuff from the subduction of the Pacific plate there and, you know, um, basalt uh, or lava upwellings and all. So, um, the, the point being, I guess, that uh, uh, this is uh, not a very good place for bees because we don't, in this location, we get about 25 inches of rain a year. And so they can grow these small grains without irrigation. Uh, but, um, but trees have a hard time getting started. If you, uh, if you water them or if they're, you know, in, in this case, there's actually kind of a little uh, drainage here. If they have moisture, if they're on the north side of the hill, for example, over here, this uh, Kamiak Butte, this is the south side, it's pretty bare. The north side is actually forested, you know, because um, it had enough moisture for those trees to get started. Originally, when the, uh, the European colonists came, moved into this area, they were huge uh, grasslands of very rich soil. Anyway, um, so I went to WSU in 1996. I had a master's student. Uh, this was right when Marla Spivak was 
uh, doing some of her work on hygienic behavior. And uh, so I had a student that began selecting for hygienic behavior just among a, a number of uh, queens that we bought from queen producers. Um, then in 2000, we got a, a large grant with Cornell University and the USDA. And, um, I, you know, of course, I would like to say it's because we were, it was such a great grant and such great ideas. In part, I think it was because they were afraid of Africanized honeybees and they wanted to have a couple of locations uh, where they would have a genetic reserve that they could draw on if Africanized bees quickly moved, you know, up into California. So uh, what we did is we, for a couple of years, we bought queens from every commercial source that would sell them to us. And we established a breeding program. Uh, Cornell, in the end, Cornell wound up not doing it. They did some other things, but so only WSU was involved in that. But that was really the start of our breeding program. We follow the, you guys, I'm sure have seen all of this. It's all in that uh, book by Page and Laidlaw. You know, we selected for traits. Uh, we kept track of it. I had a German postdoc during part of this time, Marina Meitzner. She's now a, a professor in Germany and, and she was one of Rutner's last students as, it, and as history would, oddly enough. Um, but you know, we just did standard breeding and selection. Um, uh, we had some stocks. We thought they were pretty great. We were we you know we were distributing them to uh, um, beekeeping associations and things like that. But I mean, we're not a you know we're a university, so we then got a grant to distribute them more widely, and uh, we, for a number a number of organizations would get queens from us every year, and then they. They tried to set up their own breeding associations, and um, and I would say it met with mixed success. We'll just leave that at that. Um, but then, sort of about that time, we began taking our bees to California or uh, providing queen to com commercial beekeepers and getting them to to test them, things like that. Uh, and since that time, we've continued this we'll just call it a standard breeding program uh, for um, you know, with natural mating from stocks that we don't really pay attention to the uh, say the color or any traits like that only the traits related to uh, you know surviving the winter here not having diseases uh, not stinging we don't in in general I would in uh, how do I put this? Because it's changing now. You know, my, the guy I learned beekeeping from would not let me wear gloves. So I never let any of my students, we never wear gloves. So uh, when we're doing commercial stuff, we do sometimes. But uh, so we would just not abide bees that are, you know, that, that you have to wear gloves with. I just don't want to work them. But now we, Brandon has some students and they wear gloves. It bugs me. But I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to air my dirty laundry. The, the argument was, if you wear gloves, you know, first of all, you know, you tend to crush bees. Uh, so then you, if you're a little bit afraid, you get even more afraid. The other thing is, of course, you can transmit diseases. And we don't use antibiotics in our breeding program. And so uh, if we see foul brood, you know, the colony get, goes to the, the dump. We're not allowed to burn where we are because we'd start giant wheat field fires, but uh, the things get double bagged and go to the landfill. Anyway, we've, con we've continued that. And these queens, you know, uh, we, we, we still make a few hundred a year. We make them available and so on. Yeah, that's the standard sort of queen rearing that you guys have, many of you have already done, so no problem. Now, one of the issues in, um, I know that Jerry asked me about a graph or, or some graphs we have. So I put them at the very end of this talk, Jerry, because I didn't, I wasn't sure which one you were talking about. But one of the, um, some of the early work that we did, we surveyed queen producers in both the southeastern U.S. and 
the Western U.S. And they're, they're quite different. You know, I started out, I, I did my PhD work at the University of Illinois, kind of in the middle, but I, I was from Georgia. I was familiar with queen producers in Georgia and the Southeast, you know, maybe as far west as Texas. And then in California, you know, there, it was much more concentrated around, you know, you know, I don't know, 70, 80 miles around Sacramento. So um, I made trips out here, talked to queen producers, tried to get an idea of what they were doing to, for their genetic stock. And uh, the bottom line between, of all that is that uh, in general, queen producers produce, and this really isn't including Hawaii because I, I did not at the time uh, talk to them. But U.S. queen producers in the mainland produced about a million queens a year from less than five or 600 queen mothers. So being, you know, coming from a population genetics lab to start with, that, that seemed a bit of a genetic bottleneck. First of all, you know, the genetic bottleneck of sampling some number of queens from Europe and bringing them to the new world was itself a huge genetic bottleneck you know, hundreds of years ago. And now we're every year producing a million queens from 500 queen mothers, of course, and whoever they mate with. Um, that seemed like one. So uh, the argument, uh, this was sort of a, an argument that I made over a number of years with uh, the USDA with APHIS. I should say I worked for 10 years for the USDA from 1986 to 1996, working on Africanized bees and developing molecular methods to identify Africanized bees. So I was at the Beltsville Bee Laboratory, the one now run by Jay Evans. Um, and then I moved to Washington State University. But even at that time, um, you know, there was some concern for genetic diversity, right? The small founder population, the fact that varroa mites had come, had come in and likely reduced the feral population quite a bit. And that was really important for the East, not so much for you guys in California. But in the Southeast, a number of these queen producers who had been doing it the same way their father and grandfather had done it, would graph from one or two queens and they would mate with whatever was in the woods, you know, and that, and really what I wrote in some of my early papers after my PhD was they were getting, you know, free sex allele diversity from the feral population. But once Varroa came, I'll just let you know that almost all of those queen producers are much more now like the ones in California. They maintain colonies with the drone sources and they also graph from multiple queen mothers, not one or two. Anyway, so that was my argument to the USDA that we should bring in additional genetic material uh, for breeding. And they, uh, they, they hemmed and hawed. Then the US began importing uh, bees from Australia and New Zealand. And uh, with no oversight, I'll just say no oversight of, of what they were bringing in. And so then we got a permit, we, and we've had that permit ever since, that allows us to bring in honeybee semen for breeding. Okay, um, and so I guess it started about 2008, uh, and Sue Kobe, I think, got involved by about 2010. In the early days, we would bring in this semen, we would have to coordinate having 70 to you know 100 virgin queens ready to be inseminated and you can bring that semen in at room temperature it'll last about two weeks on the outside and you can inseminate queens with them so you know everything for that trip the liquid nitrogen i mean we didn't have liquid nitrogen at that time you know the trip the travel carrying them getting the semen bringing it all back that huge expense was tied up in those, you know, 50 to 100 queens that you inseminated with semen you'd brought, you know, uh, hand carried into the US. So um, eventually, this is Brandon Hopkins when, um, when 
well, he, he actually wasn't a student at that time, but when he was a student, he began working on crowd preservation. Okay, it was very expensive to bring him in. You know, this was all funded by grants and uh, I, have a, I have an endowed position. So I was able to use money from the endowment to do this, but it was certainly not, you know, uh, cost effective. It was not uh, paying for itself or anything like that. But um, the cryopreservation really changed that. And, and this, this itself, I, I think at some point this should be almost a, a book or something, the story of how Brandon figured it out. You know, the, all of these, all of the steps in this are really well known. I mean, people have been inseminating, you know, chickens, turkeys, pigs, sheep, horses, people, you know, for a long time with frozen semen. Uh, and it just didn't seem to work with bees. And, you know, there are no, Brandon would be much better to tell you why, but they have very long tails and the tails are very delicate. But the secret was that when you collect the semen, that going from room temperature to refrigerator temperature, so from room temperature to four degrees C or 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the critical change. From four degrees centigrade to minus 190 is all the same as if you're doing human, human sperm. But, um, and so the secret was to put the little, vi the little you know, capillary tube of semen in room temperature water, put that water, you know, 500 mils, you know, couple of cups in a refrigerator for two or three hours. And that slowly gets it down to four degrees and then everything else is fine. That was the secret. And you think like, you know, how do people figure that out? And it, Brandon just tried it. Anyway, uh, so these are the, the subspecies that we've, initially we were allowed to bring in because I made the argument with USDA that these subspecies historically had been brought in and were still being, well, actually the Caucasians weren't, but weren't still really being used. But I kind of made the argument that they were because when I was a kid, you could still buy them from Sears, but um, no one really had Caucasian stock anymore. But we did have the Carniola and we had the Italian. And so that's what we, we started working with. Um, so, you know, one of the things we did uh, sort of quickly was uh, to begin bringing in Caucasian honeybees. Of course, we did not have Caucasian virgins to inseminate them into. So that, even though we now have, you know, more or less fairly pure Caucasian lines of honeybees, they, they were all by, done by back crossing from an initial cross using a carniolan virgin. So, you know, just every generation we back cross now to Caucasian stock. And within, you can do the math, but within five or six generations, you're well above 95%, um, you know, Caucasian genes in those, those bees. So that's how we did that. The uh, Sue was really excited to join in this because we're able to go to Slovenia, the one European country that does not allow uh, importation of other bee subspecies. So one of the, the failures uh, in a way from the standpoint of a geneticist of the European system is below the species level with agricultural animals, none of the European Union countries are allowed to keep other uh, stock from other countries out. So in Italy, if you're a bee, if you know, if you have the wherewithal, you can bring bees from the Netherlands into Italy and keep them. Um, I mean, you probably have to meet some, you know, sanitary laws, but you can't keep them out for genetic reasons. And this gets into that species versus subspecies story. But Slovenia, as part of their entry into the European Union, insisted on not having other bees come into Slovenia because they consider themselves the home of the carniolan honeybee. And they've 
they made it stick. So we were able to go to Slovenia and get uh, really beautiful Carniolan stock. And, and, you know, we think of Pat Hykem or, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the queen producers in California, you know, they're, they're great queen producers and they have a family history of having done it, you know, Homer Parks and those guys. One of the guys in Slovenia, his family started breeding Carniolan bees in like 1743 or something. So they, they have a really different sense of time for, uh, for some of their family businesses. Kind of interesting. And then more re recently with, uh, with Jackie Park Burris, we've, uh, even though we here in Pullman, you saw the picture of the snow, you know, an uh, Italian honeybee would not be the honeybee of choice for someone that was place bound in Northern Italy. I mean, Northern Italy, I'm sorry, Northern Idaho. But uh, as you know, the Italian honeybee is really well adapted for a lot of parts of California. And so, so we've brought that material in, but instead of maintaining kind of our own breeding line, we've ch we have it in the freezer in the liquid nitrogen and we periodically bring it out, uh, inseminate Italian stock, and then have been providing it to um, California queen producers. Okay, there it is. So uh, this one little story, for those of you that might not know it, uh, this started well before 2015. It started around, uh, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it was around 2000 or so, um, I was so interested in going to this part of the world between Apis serrana and Apis mellifera. And my, I had a reason for it and that was really looking for possibly another kind of honeybee. Uh, one of the things about Apis serrana and Apis mellifera is they're considered sister taxa. They share, you know, uh, sex pheromones. In a lot of ways, they're very similar but genetically, they're very, very distant. They, they, you know, based on their genetic sequences, they last had a common ancestor maybe six million years ago. So, my thought was that there might be something more interesting in this part of the world. Um, what, what happened is we, I went there uh, with, uh, you know, apples are are from are from. Uh, the Tian Shan Mountains of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, parts of Uzbekistan. And uh, so I went with a apple, and, and apple geneticists go to that part of the world to collect genetics of, of wild apple trees for breeding. Uh, you know, about a thousand years ago, I guess it got into Turkey and then into Europe uh, along the Silk Road, but it's really from this area. So I so uh, I went with a person who was collecting uh, parasites of apple pests, but I was really more interested in the bees. And uh, mostly what we found was the remnants of, uh, this is after the fall of the Soviet Union, we mostly found remnants of Russian style uh, beehives like these here, and also um, the sort of mentality of large, uh, um, co uh, farms, collective farms, where the like the people living out with the bees didn't really know about the bees. These veterinarian guys would come by and tell them what drugs to give the bees. Uh, it was a weirdly a weird system where people didn't seem to really kind of have the whole story. Um, now it's much changed. I mean, in 2015, it was much changed. But back then, basically, uh, in this location, right around this location, um, I, I found a, a ethnically Russian person who had moved there, you know, so he was retired, but he had moved there when he was in the 20s or something. And uh, he said, you know, there are these bees in the mountains, you know, I brought bees, I brought my bees here, but they died and these bees from the mountains are the ones that I now have. And that was the first discovery. Actually, it was in this tree here, this uh, juniper tree in a snow leopard reserve in Kazakhstan. 
there was a wild colony of bees in there. And uh, so we collected them, we collected and, we, and things and then went back to the, you know, came back to the lab and uh, did the morphometric analysis and wound up doing some molecular analysis. And it was another a subspecies quite different from others. And we were able to name it, we named it Apis for Pomanella, you know, obviously after the sort of apple story. But it, what it really meant was these mountains, of course, go into China. And in China, you have Apis serrana. So I needed to probably go further east. So this is a map of where we collected in, uh, it's not on here, but the border with China is about here somewhere. It was pretty close to that last site. So this was from Rutner's book. This was the range of Apis mellifera. This was the range of Apis serrana. And then we found this bee here and it's Apis mellifera, but it was just a big range expansion. So we have brought that uh, in. Uh, actually, there was a, a guy in his, I think it was, in his mid eighties, uh, around 2000. And he was, uh, he was a really nice man. He said that, uh, you know, he had moved to this place. This is in far Eastern uh, Kazakhstan uh, in the mountains. And, and he had moved to this place after World War II. He loved the Americans because they saved him, the Russian, from the Germans. I, it, it was a weird story told from his perspective, but at least he liked us. But um, he said he moved there and there were no bees in the mountains, but he brought bees with him and now the mountains are full of bees. But as it turned out, the, the, the bees, and this is, uh, this is about a thousand kilometers further east than here. So here you see this is about 500 kilometers or so over here where he was. And the bees that we collected in all these sites were the same. Um, and they were unlike any of the other known subspecies. So, I, you know, it was a great story. And by that time, he was no longer active. He would, he sat on kind of a chair with a cover over it, and other people did his beekeeping for him, which has given me an idea of how I want to retire. But they would then bring him frames, and he would tell them what was going on. So when I went back, you know, 15 years later, uh, Surely enough, he was no longer alive, but his wife was still alive, and uh, and he and they still had some bees. His son was now the beekeeper, and things had really—I'll uh, just tell you guys—gone really pretty far downhill uh, in the thing. And the other very very sad thing. Uh, let's see if I, I don't. Yeah, this is his wife actually here. Um, is the main thing when they found that we had been to Italy, they, they asked us if we could please give them some of those Italian honeybees because they had heard they made so much more honey. And they have this amazing bee, you know, adapted from this region. And, you know, I tried to explain that we couldn't, but in the end, I think they really resented us like we were withholding the Italian honeybee from them. But it's kind of sad. Um, but and this is Brand Brandon uh, collecting semen in a chicken coop uh, at this location. So this is the kind of stuff that we we would do. Uh, this is in 2015. Also, they've they, it used to be a dirt road that took you many. Well, no, it wasn't dirt. It was paved, kind of. Uh, it used to. It took a long time to go to this place, but now they have this. Um, this big road, but the farmers are allowed to have first. So the farmers, you know, uh, like here, this guy has all these sheep on it. And what you don't see is sometimes is the guy will have his sheep on it and there will be lines of very, very angry people in BMWs and fancy cars honking their horn and the, the farmers walking along with his sheep on the road because that was the road they've always used and the government said they could still use it. So. That's kind of, I kind of like that a little bit. But the, the main bottom line is that these old world populations are a source of novel genetic material that we can use through importation and cryopreservation. Uh, let's, let's see. Um, yes, so, you know, we're continuing to import, evaluate, and distribute this material, especially the Caucasian breeder queens. 
they've been uh, there's been increasing demand for those. I'm sure probably not from you know people from warm climates, but uh, a number of the queen producers in California, we we supply them with instrumentally inseminated breeder queens, and and they then graft from them, and you know they mate naturally with whatever stock they have, and. Uh, and they, apparently people are like, they, they're very gentle bees. They're very uh, adapted to cold climates. If you're used to Italian honeybees, you'll be a little upset because they overwinter as a fairly small um, cluster. They don't overwinter as a big colony. The other really weird thing, uh, I've, we've been in Georgia in mid-July, maybe, maybe a little bit early July. And the colonies are already getting rid of all the males. So all the drones are being driven out. They're pathetically hanging on the front of the beehive, um, which is good for us because we're collecting the drones, right? So uh, uh, we have been there just at the right time to where all we had to do was scoop cupfuls of drones off of beehives. But uh, I noticed this as a graduate student at the University of Illinois. My master's work, I looked at three different strains of bees that you could buy in the US at that time. They were supposedly Caucasian, Carniolan, and Italian. Um, and uh, the main thing that I know, I mean, I, I was doing other work on pollination with soybeans, but the, um, I noticed then that the Italian honeybees uh, kept their drones much later in the season than the dark subspeed the dark bees the, the black bees and they the black bees were very deliberate in driving out the males and that's of course an adaptation to having a cold climate where you need all the food that you can have just to make it through the winter so and then the new world carniolan program you probably know about this program it's fairly famous because of sue kobe and uh in the last eight or so years we've been uh infusing carniolan uh, semen from Slovenia into it. And one of the things that, that she's doing is, is uh, uh, letting the production of breeder queens go to queen producers. And that right now, uh, it's kind of in the works, but it, it's uh, you know, Buzz Landon and Valerie uh, Strachan. Okay, yeah, th this, th actually, this is a slide from Susan's talk, so I, I, I skip that. Um, I mean, unless you want to know about it, this New World Carniolan is, is her, her trademark thing. And also in an earlier slide, I stole this picture of her queen number 58. So they, they don't really, you can't really breed them with those numbers on them. <clears throat> this, is, this is a very good queen producer in Italy. Uh, so we, you know, for a few years, we brought back Italian semen and we would inseminate queens. And I'll just tell you that the Italian queen producers did not like them very much. They said they're not yellow enough. And, you know, if you say that to Italian queen producers, they don't know what you're talking about. They have no idea that their, that their bees are supposed to be yellow. It's only in the U.S. that we think they're yellow. But this particular queen producer, um, they, they'd been around since the, the 1850s or so. And he is from the area of Bologna. And I suspect that he, uh, he you know, the very first Italian queens that came into the US were uh, from that region, uh, Reggio Emilia and Bologna and things like that. So it's from that region. And his bees were yellow enough that Jackie Park Burris picture here was, uh, you know, uh, liked them. And then very sadly, this guy's in his 40s. He, he passed away last year. So it's, it's, I, um, that was a real shame. Um, and then, you know, this, this is also in Italy collecting semen. I mean, our days in these really exotic places are usually going to a bee yard <laughs> but you know, by the early afternoon, collecting as many drones as we can, and then uh, ejaculating them and collecting semen for the rest of the day. 
unfortunately, I, I think maybe, I don't know if that's box wine or not, but we had some pretty good wine. Um, this is, uh, so uh, what we would, what we do is we, we produce instrumentally inseminated breeder queens here at WSU. And then in some cases, the queen producers drive up here and get them. So each of these has an instrument, instrumentally inseminated breeder queen. I'll tell you that about half of these are carniolans probably going um, to uh, queen producers north of you. And then the other half, in this case, were Italians that Jackie Park Burris was uh, coming to pick up. Or sometimes we drive to, we, we've done a number of, you know, driving to Oregon and meeting queen producers halfway to get the stock to them. And then the, the, the other thing that I, you might not know about is uh, that we, uh, the National Animal Germplasm Laboratory uh, program in Fort Collins, Colorado, has the, they're, in, they're charged with maintaining the genetic diversity of agricultural animals. And so they have semen from everything you can imagine, oysters, uh, you know, I mean, you know, chickens, rare breeds of chickens, rare breeds of sheep, rare breeds of cows, things like that. And, and the modern, like um, chicken, the chicken industry apparently uh, if your chicken breeding is two or three years old, they don't even care. They'll, they'll give it away to you because the breeding is going so rapidly there. But anyway, uh, they did not have honeybees uh, because no one had perfected the ability, the way to freeze it and have it still be viable. And so with, uh, so WSU, we were able to put the first uh, samples into liquid nitrogen. So you know it's tank 71. There are hundreds of tanks in this underground layer kind of place, but uh, tank 71 has the honeybees. You know, after the nuclear blast, we can go get it out. Um, and um, we've also gotten uh, some funding from them to, to begin to collect the diversity of honeybees that we have in this country from small queen producers as well, not just, you know, the, the big ones, and, uh, and put that in um, cryogenic storage. So we have a, a similar thing at WSU, not nearly this big or fancy, and we only have bee semen in it. But um, yeah, so that's going on. And then the more, uh, one of the latest things happening uh, it was supposed to maybe happen this year, uh, is the idea to have an international network of germplasm repositories. So we have one, there's one group in Germany working on uh, crowd preservation of honeybee semen. But, and I even went to Berlin and we met with uh, an international group, but the German government says they're only interested in keeping German bees in their 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 germplasm um, repository, which is crazy because of course the bees that the Germans use is Apis mellifera carnica, which is not native to Germany. You know, they they got rid of their native Apis mellifera mellifera mainly because of the influence of Rutner, you know, for the better carniolan bee. So it's kind of funny to hear German regulatory types telling the scientists that no, we will not keep these other subspecies of bees, we'll only keep German bees in the bees they have is that aren't from Germany. But anyway, sorry, that's political, I guess. But um, honeybee germ puzzle repositories, for us, you know, here in the US, we could say, well, it's mainly because we want the diversity for our breeding and commercial uses or whatever. For other countries, it's conservation, especially places like Italy that where they are real, the, they're really afraid of losing their genetic diversity because of the importation of stock from all over Europe. And then other countries like Malta, for example, you know, they have 400,000 people living in the country of Malta that is the biggest island of three is, I don't know, 13 by 28 kilometers. And then there's one that's three by seven kilometers and one that's one by two kilometers. Those three islands, uh, they have their own indigenous 
subspecies of honeybee, if you can believe it, is pretty closely related to the North African honeybee. Uh, and they've been crazily importing Italian stock for years there also. So, well, yeah, that's, but anyway, so, so conservation, the rest of the world or the places where the honeybee is native, they really need this technology for conservation. So the, the, the Apamondia, there, there's a scientific committee that's pushing to try to establish at least one repository on each continent. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, that's Italy. Oh, uh, do we still have time? I mean, I can keep talking. This is, uh, this was our last international trip. We didn't go last year and we won't go this year. But this is Lionel Garnery. He's a great guy. Um, he's he's an amazing population geneticist. He did a, a postdoc sort of in my lab or really a sabbatical, I'll say some years ago. And he's working on Apis mellifera for the dark bee of Northern Europe, but the ones in France. And those are, uh, those are, sign those are all uh, little regional reserves. They have genetic reserves for the honeybee, for their honeybee, and they don't let other types of bees in there. And it's really supported by the beekeepers. This is an, the, an island uh, where they have the, you know, this native Apis mellifera mellifera there, and they are uh, protecting it. There are other people trying to bring other bees to this island, and you can't bring bees from other islands. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, so we collected from a lot of these places, these reserves, even that island. And we have it in our liquid nitrogen tank, but the agreement, we said, this is for you. You know, we, we just have it, but we're not intending to use it or sell it or do anything like that. So um, there it is. And it, so it's, it's a big collaboration to try to get this thing going on, uh, going. And um, that's it, that, that's really it. This, this is really a homage to Brandon and his students and, and where this is going, you know, the, we like to use words like it allows people to breed, but you know, between space and time because you, you know, progeny testing is a big thing with cattle breeding where you can, if you, you can discover through the effects of progeny generations later that perhaps a bull that you had from 1969 is the key to why all these progeny are wonderful. So then you can go back and use the semen from that superior bull that you only discovered with superior, you know, 20 years later or 15 years later. Uh, so it will allow us with honeybees to do the same thing, to do this progeny test. So these are Icelandic sheep and this is, this is, this place where we are right where you saw those pictures, but in the summertime. Okay. So, so there it is, y'all. Um, thank those of you that are still there. And uh, well, I'll take any questions. Pretty much still but, stuck around. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like some people did. Thank, well, thank you for yeah, that. I'm sorry, it, it is a little weird doing this because I feel like I'm just talking to my computer a bit, but I know you're on the other end of it. So thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, the graph that I remember from the uh, Davis program um, uh, had two spots in it. Uh, I know, okay, let me show it to you. Believe it or not, not those. The, the, this was, uh, this was, uh, in 1993, I had a postdoc that did this work and found that, you know, about, we'll say about a million, it's 900,000 queens were produced by 40 queen producers from about 600 queen mothers. And then, you know, whatever, uh, 10 years later, 12 years later, the number hadn't really changed. This is the one you're talking about, right? That one? I can't yeah, see you it. need to share your screen share. again. Oh, oh, that's so brilliant. I'm sorry. Dead gummit. Uh, okay. Not the smartest tool in the shed. If I can wait. How do I show? Okay. 
share screen. Got it. Got it. Okay, let's this one. And I hit share. And then I come here and I do this thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, these, th this was, I don't think these were those. But this is just showing that after about a decade later, nothing had changed. They were still producing about a million queens. In this case, it was from less than 500 queen mothers. But uh, I think this is the one you're talking about. No? Well, I remember one that had a spot for West Coast Queens and a spot for East Coast Queens. Mm. And, a, and a big field that had all the rest of the ferals in it. Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that screen here. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, now how do I stop this? Oh, no. Uh, uh, up at the top. Stop, stop sharing. Okay, there you go. Yeah, no, the one that you're talking about was actually, was actually discriminant analysis showing that using those microsatellite alleles. So um, I will share this. I'll, I'll do this one here. Let me try sharing again. Uh, share screen. Okay, then I bring that up there. I think share. Then this one. So um, how do I make this larger uh, there? Okay, so um, using these microsatellites, which are, um, you can think of them as polymorphic regions randomly distributed throughout the, D the DNA, but uh, we looked at 127 colonies from the old world and 113 from California and looked for those 10 different alleles, I mean, those 10 different loci, so kind of 10 different locations in the genome, we looked at the different forms that were present there. And what we found was there were 170 different alleles so for those 10 loci. So you could say on the average 17 alleles per locus, 17 different colors of a house at a location. Think of it however you want. But um, And of those 170, 75 were shared between the old world and California, and 95 were unique, found only in California or only in the old world. And the question to you is, how do you think they were distributed? Uh, and the answer is this, all, you know, most of the unique alleles were found in the old world, while, you know, 12% were found in California. And all of that's there's a lot of possibilities for sampling error in this with that small sample size. But the point being that this is the argument that the old world represents a lot of genetic diversity that probably never got here that we can use you know, in breeding. So that was what that one was. But the one that you're talking about was that we can take those same alleles and think of them as uh, information for the morphometrics and you can do the same kind of morphometric graphs that you haven't seen that we, that we can that we do and and we showed that this little population of of say that the eastern or western uh commercial bees were different from each other is is that what we're talking about that's the and one that, that i think i remember sense because uh, i i mean Maybe it's changed now, but back when I was a graduate student and soon after, you would talk to people in, we'll say Georgia, you know, they might call their buddy over in Alabama or Louisiana and, you know, get some stock from them because they were running low or they lost some breeder queens and they know they have good stock. Get, you know, let's get some of your stock. They would never call California. And likewise, the guys in California, they'll, they'll, they'll share stock among themselves, but they were never going to call someone in Georgia or Florida to get bees from there. So there was kind of a bit of an isolation of those two groups who would then mix among themselves. So, I mean, the things that we heard anecdotally talking to them, you could kind of see in the data as well. Oh, but you know the original the original work that we did on that, and that's all before I was well. I want to say all before I was 
at WSU, but um, you know, it, so in that, that early work, when I was in the USDA, what we showed was that the feral population represented a huge amount of genetic diversity compared to the diversity within commercial populations of honeybees. So if you were some guy with bees in Tennessee, you know, and you, they were mating, mating, you know, you were getting diversity that had been there since the beginning in that wild population. Uh, in California, because it was a really different situation from the beginning, they, they already instinct, I don't know if instinctively, but the way they were breeding bees, the way that they were mating queens and everything was much more sophisticated than in the East because they had to, I mean, they had to put colonies out there with drones, I think, to get good mating. Whereas in the East, you know, if your queens fly up there, they're going to mate with something. So they, they didn't even pay attention to drone colonies, you know, back in, uh, back in the 1980s, you know, when I was there. So. I have a well, question. Me to ask another question um, about how um, queen breeders select their, uh, their stock and whether they optimize them for the almond pollination or for shipping packages to the Midwest or, you know, what are they breeding for? And is that good for us locally or is that bad for us locally? Hmm. You know, I, I'll bet you if you talk to five or 10 different ones, you would get five or 10 different answers. So, I, I mean, you know, I have heard them, I have, you know, in the, Let's take the old days, you know, let's say geezer, we get to talk about the old days. You know, before the border with Canada was kind of restricted, a lot of the queen producers would get feedback on honey production from Canadian customers who would say, these queens, you know, produce 400 pounds of honey and they would even maybe send them back. And so you you talk to Pat Highcomb or some of the, some of the you know, uh, Leonard Pankratz, the now retired kind of guys who used to do it, they remembered their, either themselves or their dads getting, uh, uh, getting material back and then grafting from that the next year. And because their customers wanted honey production. Uh, you know, the, 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 the immediate, the short-term thing, if you're a uh, you know, if you're producing packages, you probably want bees that when you feed them, they brood up well. You know, you can make them expand really rapidly. You can produce a lot of bees in a short amount of time. And so you might be basically selecting for, for bees that are, have very, very sort of mainstream Italian characteristics of responding to brief honey flows by exploding in, in their size, because that's what you want. You know, you want to shake from them every 10 days or something like that. Um, whether you're going to find ones that say they, uh, you know, especially in California, you know, are they trying to select for overwintering behavior? Are they trying to select for not having to treat very much for varroa mites? Not many of them, not many of them are, you know, I think have that on their thing. A lot of them, um, you know, the commercial cream producers up here in Washington that, you know, some of them they have 20,000 colonies, they would hear from queen producers in California the latest and greatest ways to try to control mites, you know, kind of off the record. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I think if you're buying from a commercial queen producer, it's a good conversation to have to, you know, and, and it, it, the best thing is to find one that will be honest and just tell you what they're doing. And, and a lot of them, I think, will tell you they're treating, you know, they have to treat a lot. They can't afford to risk their colonies, you know, getting mites. And they're, they're trying to select for, for bees that have strong colonies and overwinter well and don't, you know, show diseases. But how many, you know, my art, you know, it's easy to be in the ivory tower and complete, 
I, I, let me give you a little story. 15 years ago or so, there's a great paper from Australia. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I can find it and send it to you, Jerry. You can pass it around. But the, this, um, this um, scientist did a study where they, uh, they took queens, they, they made queens, and they left them in the mating nuke for different amounts of time. Either, I'm just going to pick these out of the air, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. So they'd leave, they, they, they would put the queen cell in there, the queen would come out and they'd wait a week and they'd cage her. She's done. Or two weeks or three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. And then they sent 20 queens treated that way of, of each treatment. So every beekeeper got a hundred queens, 20 that had been only in the mating nuke one week, 20, you know, so on. And then they then followed them after I think, uh, like 12 weeks, you know, two different time periods. One was a short one, like maybe um, six weeks, and one was six months later, you know, whether the queen was still there. And it was a very clear pattern that three, you know, uh, maybe after two weeks, 40% uh, of the queens were still there after six months. But if you left them in the mating nuke for three weeks, it was like 70% of them were still in their hive, you know, uh, three, whatever, six weeks later. And if you left them four weeks, it was a little more of an increase, maybe up to 85%. And then five weeks is a little more of an increase. But the big break was like between, say, three and four weeks. If you, um, the difference between two weeks and three weeks was, say, 50% in the survival um, six months later. So if they were only in there two weeks, the chances of them being in that colony, heading that colony six months later was something like 50%. So I presented all that information. I, I thought it was a great study. Gave it to the queen producers in California. And some of them have changed their practices to where they leave it maybe three weeks or at least two weeks because some of them were pulling the queens after 10 days. So there's something about being in your mating nuke and being able to become more of a queen and develop your, your pheromones and everything that makes you more attractive and, and makes you be able to head a colony better later in life than if you're snatched out too soon. So, so, if, so my idea was what you should do is keep some of them in there four weeks charge more money for them and and uh because a lot of beekeepers the consumers that i've talked to said i would pay twice as much for a queen if if i knew they were going to be there after six months you know the uh but the queen producer you know they're if they can take that queen out and put another cell in they can sell another queen so it's a big conflict you know some of them may have made changes and some haven't. Uh, Leslie, you had a question. Yeah, I did have a question. It was get, kind of getting back to um, the relatedness of all the different species of bees that you found. And, you know, I started thinking about this when you were showing um, how many shared alleles between the old world and, um, and the California bees. And uh -huh. so, it, do you have a diagram of like a phylogenetic tree or, you know, showing how far back some of these are related to each other? And, mm -hmm. um, and especially like in Malta, you're saying how they're really trying to import a lot of the Italian queens, but they have this one, I guess it's indigenous bee yeah. there. Um, and could maybe that if you would show them you know, how their indigenous bee relates to all these others and how it might be of, of value, even if it might not be the highest producer or something, but that in, in order to preserve diversity of the species, it might be interesting. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And, and you know, that early on was my, uh, sort of my area. And in fact, the reason well, I, I did my PhD in the laboratory of a guy that was uh, a tefritted fruit fly specialist. He worked on the evolution of uh, the, the group that includes the apple maggot and the blueberry maggot, you know, that, the tefritteds, the picture wing flies. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the the genetic markers I had available at that time were too crude to show any relationship among subspecies and uh, too, um, too different from each other to show the relationships among the species. So well, it was- so You a only had a, a few selected genes that you were typing at the time, but now you're, right, right. you have the microsatellite. The yes. Right, and so you, you know, the, there are a couple of issues with subspecies, as, and especially with, in, you should, if you're really interested, these papers by Pierre Franck and, and uh, Lionel Garnery, one of the things is, you know, these, these glaciation events, for example, with the Italian honeybee, you know, they were repeated many times. So many times the bees were put into refuges, not just once, and then they came back. So as they came back and went through, there was mixing. So it, it turns out that, uh, you know, uh, there's no reason to necessarily think the subspecies evolved like species do in a bifurcating way. It could be, you know, you know um, polytail sort of thing. So, I mean, we can show, you know, we can, we can show that these things are genetically different, but like the person living in Kazakhstan and like the, uh, the beekeeper in Nepal, you know, Nepal was one of the last countries to allow Apis mellifera in. It was a, it was a royal uh, edict that you could not bring in Apis mellifera, but people did anyway. And then, you know, beekeepers said, you know, for 20 years I kept Apis serrana and I rode a bicycle and now I keep Apis mellifera and I drive a truck. So it's, it's economics and the perception of what is valuable. And unfortunately, it's kind of the behavior of beekeepers to think that the bees from that place over there must be better than our bees. And so they want them. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, uh, it's not a satisfactory answer for you, uh, really. Uh, I mean, I, I you know, that certainly uh, Lionel Garnery in France, you know, he's preached his entire career about the importance of maintaining even the diversity of Apis mellifera throughout the different regions of France. And he's gotten some traction. But most other places like Germany, Belgium, you know, they are in breeding programs where they are selecting for breeding values related to honey production or things that beekeepers want. They're not interested really in preserving the little pocket of these bees that were in this valley in this upper part of Switzerland. Right. Well, one of the yeah. things that we do in, in our club, we have a small breakout group called the Local Bee Initiative that um, Phil uh, helps to lead and we were talking about, you know, adaptation that happens in the local um, yeah. microclimate. I mean, even in the East Bay here, we have lots of different microclimates. So um, anyway, we talk a lot about, you know, bee genetics and how adaptation to our local areas might be beneficial or not depending on different bees that we're, we're looking at and how to breed them for that. I think that's really cool. Uh, you know, if there's any way, you know, that, that we can help, let us know. Like the other thing is you, if you have something that you really like, we could cryopreserve that semen. And then at some point in the future, you, you, we could get virgins from you and we could inseminate them with that semen. So, you know, this, it's sort of in the infancy, you know, this was, this thing with cryopreservation and, and insemination was started in the 50s, you know, with uh, dairy cattle. And they've made amazing strides in milk production related to, to these sort of breeding value type things. But um, I mean, you know, almost every beekeeper you talk to, what these, 
queen producers or or even just large scale beekeepers may remember some stock that they had 20 years ago or that their uncle had, their dad had, and they remembered those bees a lot. And, and now we could actually conserve those things. Mm. Good to know, thank I, you. I have a question. Yes. About, um, thank you, by the way, for your talk. It was very interesting, even for a uh, layman cook like myself, but you're kind of doing some cooking too. Um, so about aggressiveness, I know that you like working with um, gentler bees, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I've just kind of noticed in my own apiary that the a little more um, ratcheted up bee um, produces more propolis, um, gets smaller um, during the seasons, and is um, a better at um, keeping mites uh, or being more yeah, in control of mites. And have you found any of that to be true? Ah, well, it's interesting you put it that way. Um, you know, I lived for a year in Brazil and worked with, with Africanized bees there. And of course, you know, they're pretty defensive. Um, they really, um, you can work them without gloves. You, you know, it, they're, the threshold is just much lower, right? To get them stimulated, right? And they, as you know, they don't, um, they don't really treat them for varroa mites in Brazil. So th that Africanized bee, you know, is able to deal with mites, whether it's uh, related to the genes related to defensiveness is, is hasn't been shown you know, they have a much shorter post-capping development time and some things that allow, and they swarm a lot, so things that kind of allow them to, uh, you know, outrun the mites and slows down the reproduction of the mites because the mites don't have as much time to develop uh, and, you know, uh, their, their population growth of the mite population is lower. So I haven't seen that. I, you know, anecdotally, I'll say i I felt the same way when I was uh, an undergraduate and, and I, uh, between undergraduate and graduate school, I was a technician at the University of Georgia. And I got about, I built up to about 50 beehives. And uh, some of the ones I got were from, I bought used from someone and they were in eight frame equipment. And they were the meanest bees I'd until that time had ever dealt with. They were so mean in this one colony, I could never find the queen. I could never find it, but they were so mean. And they were by far the biggest queen producers. I mean, biggest uh, honey producers. So anecdotally, I would have said the same thing. You know, sometimes that sort of behavior has, like if you put Africanized bees side by side with European bees, oftentimes the Africanized bees will produce more honey, but they're also robbing out the European bees or, or things like that. So, you know, I, we're, we're not, um, I mean, we're not completely de against defensiveness. Don't get me wrong. You know, defensiveness has its place, but if usually when I get stung, I feel like it's my fault. Like I did, you know, okay, fair enough. But you know, if it's a, a good day and the bees are not, um, the bees are really nervous, then I just don't really want, I, I don't breed for that. And it's, you know, when I was in, um, first in graduate school and I met Homer Park, you know, in, I don't know, 1980 or something or early eighties. And, uh, and I was asking all these stupid graduate student questions because I was trying to keep track you know, how many breeder queens do you use? How many queens do you produce? I'm not from the IRS. You know, I had to say things like that. And, um, and the, you know, his test, if you've talked to these queens, they all tell you Homer's test. He would pick up the queen bee a few inches off the, off the comb and drop her, drop her several times. And she's supposed to just walk around and not get excited. If she got excited, he wouldn't breed from her. That was his test for like uh, nervous behavior. But so everyone has their own idea, I guess. If, if, you're, if you like your bees and you like, you know, in, in Brazil, 
They kind of like the defensive bees because why? It keeps people from stealing them or robbing them. So, the, you know, uh, I, I did, when I was in the USD, I did a big collecting uh, a number of times in Argentina and I was studying the hybrid zone of genetic introgression between Africanized and European bees as, as you went south in Argentina. And we ran across beekeepers who said, oh yeah, you know, about 10 years ago, we had those Africanized bees, but we don't have them anymore. And like, okay, so then you would ask them more questions about how they keep bees. Well, now they only, um, they, they, um, they no longer make splits or anything because their empty hives fill up in the spring with swarms. They can only work the bees at night because otherwise they sting the cattle and they'll lose their locations that they have. And so you realize the beekeepers have changed and they think the bees are the same. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's all good. Um, I mean, I, I don't hate aggressive bees. I, I just pref I just enjoy working them without gloves. Maybe that's it. I would just say that um, I have not had the experience that um, aggressive bees are more likely to produce more, though I've heard that from a number of people. Um, my own experience is that I have lines of bees that produce really well and are very gentle. And I've had uh, lines of bees that were very aggressive and I really wanted to get rid of and, uh, uh, and they did, uh, okay, they produced all right, but you know, I didn't, I had other bees that were gentle and produced a lot. So I'm not convinced yet that that's not just, uh, you know, a fluke. So I, um, I also wanted to mention that, uh, Although I'm a member of the Alameda Club, I live in San Mateo County, and uh, I'm really interested in what the Alameda group does because I also tried to start a uh, group we were called the Bee Selective, and we were trying to raise local bees. And um, one of the things that we did as part of that effort was to do uh, a census of our bees. Uh, of our hives and how many were lost and where they were from and so on. So uh, one of the things that we found in that was that our package bees did really badly uh, and our nukes did much better if we did, if you bought nukes and if we did splits or swarms, that was all better, but basically the package bees did really badly. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about why we might have that kind of experience? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we we buy a lot of packages every year, uh, also, and of course, you know, if you have a a colony that you can start out with with comb and and some brood making splits, it's it's much better than than um, packages. There's a, a decent. I shouldn't say that. There's a paper by Nick Calderon uh, and my former student, Jamie Strange, now uh, at Ohio State, um, was a postdoc after he got his PhD here, where they, they looked, they bought packages from a number of sources and then took them apart to see what was in them. And uh, you would be surprised. Uh, it, I, I, this paper is available. If you look up, it's probably Strange and Calderon or something. Uh, they um, What they found was, A, a lot of time, I think there were as many as 20 or 30% drones in some of the packages. Some of them had huge mite loads. Uh, so, you know, th there are issues like that. I mean, you can just get bad packages. But, but the, for us, I mean, the harshest thing for a package around here is uh, you get this package and, you know, uh, you're, you're, you may either be putting it on comb where something, you know, died and rotted in it during the winter, or you're putting them just on foundation. And, the, you know, it's a hard start for them. I, and I think that's why, you, you know, certainly a swarm is is like a gift, you know. Uh, 
the way that they seem to work so different, so much more different than a, than a package does. So, uh, um, we, we so some of it's related to just the quality of the package and some of it's, I think, related to the, the fact that it's, you know, if you have colonies where you can contribute a couple of frames or a frame of broods and things like that into colonies that you're starting from packages, you're much better off. So you don't think it's the genetics, you think it could be the... Uh, well, the other factor would be that the that the queen might not have laid for very long before being packaged up. Yes, your point before. Yeah. There you go. Two yeah. weeks versus three weeks versus four weeks. That sort of that thing. That paper, that is a great, you know, I use that. I, I teach a honeybee biology class here. And I, I don't know, I, I you know, there's a few papers in my life that I, I really like a lot. There's a, one by a guy named William Rice, but it, it's about actually... Uh, reproduction in uh, fruit flies, but it but it um, it informs some of the stuff we're doing with bees, too. It, it was really great. Um, and the other one is this paper by these Australian guys. Not that I remember their names, but I remember the paper. I know. Do you, do you have you guys read that? Have some of you read? You know the paper I'm talking about? Maybe. I haven't. I'd be delighted if you would share it with us. I would. Yeah, Jerry. Don't let me forget. Uh, I'll get it to you tomorrow. Because we found that with the package bees, it didn't matter whether the beekeeper was a very experienced beekeeper or not. So it didn't seem as if, you know, it could be a one-year beekeeper or a 30-year beekeeper. So it wasn't some experience that they had that they knew how to handle the package better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, in our case now, uh, you know, we supply uh, Caucasian breeder queens to uh, a queen producer, and the packages we get are from him, and they're they're daughters of our own, uh, you know, of our queens, but mated with, you know, whatever stuff he has around there. But, you know, we we get packages, we, we get colonies going, and then we requeen everything ourselves. So at the end of the season, we usually have a bunch of package queens we're trying to give away and things. So, but um, we, we've seen the same thing where you have like failures uh, and it's usually seems to be related to queen failures of, of uh, colonies started with packages. They maybe even seem to be starting out okay. And then you go in there and the queen's gone or something, you know, and then you have these weird things where they, they don't make another queen or there's, I know we all have those kind of stories. You know, the queen producers, you know, hate hearing them because, you know, they feel like everyone's blaming them for stuff. And then, you know, they want to blame the treatment of the way the queens were shipped. And also it's, um, it's not a good thing. But yeah, the, the obviously if, if you're getting packages and you really just need the bodies of those bees, then if you can can bolster them any way you can. That's a that's a great idea. And then the other thing is maybe produce some extra queens and you know play with sort of trying to get them through the winter, you know, in you know, banking a few or some crazy stuff like that. We we've accidentally, we've done some things accidentally that I couldn't believe, like. Uh, we had those styro we had some styrofoam mating nukes out here and i just you know i some of them i just i, I don't know what happened you know I, we just didn't get around to them at the end they they were covered with snow most of the winter and then in the spring several of them had you know a queen and 400 workers and they were doing great they just overwintered on little tiny chips of frame you know i mean you would never want to do that but i was that was wild so but you know if you could have some of your own it, especially if you were trying to do your own breeding then uh, i guess we consider packages not you know um we don't consider the queens that integral to them they do need to live for a few months you know but um we, we're not buying them and hoping to make take those queens through the winter but that's our own that's sort of here. counter to what the basic beekeeping books say, get your package and you're good to go, as opposed to um, 
you have your to package and to make sure you're genetics in there for the winner right yeah that's they don't want to hear that can you would you be willing to define all of the lingo um evolution natural selection evolve adapt just to set the you know the the um the structure of the bees um, I mean, I think it's what natural selection with hybridization is over a hundred million years of the evolution. But we, no, we use a I, lot. I, a lot of a lot of people use evolution as as the term, and that takes a little bit longer than you know a few years in the backyard. I'm assuming. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. The, you know what we're doing is is our. You know you. It, they, we used to define it as artificial selection, right? We are, we are becoming the selective force. You know, if you're in a, if you, you know, if you had some organism that was in a place that began to dry up, then over the time, that long time that it took that place to dry up for, for, you know, that organism or descendants to survive, they would have had to have, you know, Develop, they would have had to have adapted to that. And that adapt, adaptation, you know, is through the process of natural selection where the ones that are able to survive in it, you know, produce more progeny to the next generation and so on. And, and our, you know, one thing I really think about is the fact that we have all these breeds of animals, of dogs, and not so much dogs, but of say cattle and things, and they were all done by people that were not geneticists. You know, the, these you know, people living, and what made me really think about this was one of the first times I saw Caucasian honeybees in the wild was in this remote part of Turkey, right next to the Georgia border. And the people were collecting these understory plants with big leaves. And I didn't know, I said, you know, what, what are you, you doing? It was in the summer. And they said, oh, that's for the cows for the winter time. And they have these cows that are about four feet tall, and they they're uh, uh, they look, you know, they're some kind. They look like some sort of small Jersey cow or something. Uh, they they use them for for mainly milk. They go up to the high um, pastures and they uh, get milk and make cheese and I guess eat them and all that. And then in the winter time, they feed them these leaves from the forest. It's a very uh, like you can only access it part of the year. Uh, and in fact, if you get injured, they have a special um, passport that allows them to go into the country of Georgia because they can't go back into Turkey. They have to go through Georgia to get to Turkey because of the big mountains behind them. But this cow, which, uh, I mean, this variety of cow is some little tiny cow that they've, uh, selected for that can live, I guess, in, you know, with the food that they can provide it. And, uh, and they've done fine and they were not geneticists. So that was just selecting the cows I expect that lived. And uh, the, we have this weird thing because genetic, I, you know, as a geneticist, I talk about genetic diversity and the idea of maintaining diversity. So you have all these possible genetic combinations that could be made that could allow you to respond or survive, you know, as the planet changes or we have, you know, changes in rainfall or, or the types of plants that are around. But really, as a beekeeper or as a farmer, you don't want, you know, a hundred colonies with 10 of them that produce a lot of honey and, uh, you know, 10 of them that produce no honey and you don't want a bunch of diversity in that so you're selecting you're trying to select for um, uniformity of certain traits that you find important like maybe they don't sting you or they they produce a lot of honey or they you know all survive the winter really well and and start start up you know late in the spring because you sometimes have a a fake early spring and like Italians, they would expand and then freeze out. So, um, so it's a dance between diversity that you need as the, the raw material and um, not diversity, which is what you want for the certain traits you're interested in. So that's the artificial selection. 
So this whole, th I mean, evolution at one level is what, what we perceive is a much longer process, you know, that, that goes along with long time periods. But this other favorite paper of mine, now that you brought this out, and I'm going to tell you about it, sorry, is a, is a great paper um, on, um, so let me just tell you this story. In Drosophila, if you're a female, you want to mate with two males. And if you're a male, you want to be, I think you, I can't remember for sure. You want to be the only male, or maybe you want to be like the second male. It doesn't really matter. You really want to be the only male. Um, uh, because the female, one male can, um, all of his sperm will fertilize about 70% of the eggs of a female. So if you're the only male, all of your sperm gets used. If you're a female, you want to mate with two males because that way all of your eggs get used. But one of the males loses out. I can't remember if it's the first or second. It doesn't matter for the purposes of our conversation. But in Drosophila, they have this ability to make these isogenic lines. So by maintaining certain lines of flies, you can cross them and then the females are genetically identical from generation to generation. The males, when they mate with a female, they produce a fluid, an accessory gland fluid that for the purposes of this talk, because I don't really know the answer, makes the female a little bit sick. So you mate with the female, she's a little bit sick and she doesn't mate for a certain amount of time. Uh, let's say, 10 minutes, I don't know, some amount of time. Um, and if you're lucky, she won't mate and then she'll go lay eggs and they're all, all your sperm gets used. So, so you got that. So what this guy did, William Rice, he was in California, he got hired away by Harvard. Uh, William Rice, he, he allowed the males to evolve and the females not to evolve. So, Every generation he presented, and so, so let's say at the start of this experiment, on the average, 80% of the females mated twice and 20% only mated one time. You know, they got caught with the accessory gland fluid and they didn't feel good and they didn't mate again. Uh, so what he did is uh, after that first generation, he took all the males out, uh, and then mated the, them with another set of females that were identical to the first one. And he did that for 20 generations. I don't know how long that takes, but it's not you know, like what we would normally consider evolutionary time. Um, af and he, he did it 20 and 40 generations. But after 20 generations, now, and remember he's putting them back with the genetically identical females as the first generation after um, 20 generations, now 80% of the females did not remate and only 20% of them mated twice. So the males increased their fitness at the expense of the females. So in nature, that wouldn't happen, of course, because selection is acting on both of them. But in this experiment, he was able to not let the females evolve in response to these fluids and the males could just develop more and more, you know, evil uh, anti-mating fluid for the females to increase their own fitness. And the ones that did that, of course, produced more males for the next generation. And then he followed it, he did it for 40 generations, it was even worse. So it's a super cool paper kind of showing uh, evolution taking place at that level of the female reproductive tract. And that led us to think of experiments we could do using queen honeybees and their spermatheca because they keep the sperm for you know a long time. So I've kind of given you a little bit of Kirsten's project, but uh, it's, a, it's a super cool paper. Oh, that sounds great. Anyway, sorry. Thanks for all that info. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. I can't believe no, you that's, guys. That's are... great perspective. That's great. Yeah. Okay.
So I, I have one more question. Um, we had a lecture, um, this uh, great gentleman named Wally, Wally, what's Wally's last name, Jerry? Shaw. Wally Shaw from um, the Netherlands. Anglesey. Oh, from Anglesey. Um, England, and he, Wales. Wales, he, wow. He had talked about, um, you know, grafting and how the bees would do a much better job of deciding um, what was the better egg to move forward. Um, and when we graft, we don't necessarily, um, we're not, you know, we're clueless, right? Um, until maybe later, having seen her behavior, did we do right or wrong? Um, mm -hmm. Just your thoughts on that. Mm. So, so um, you would uncap all the queens and let them all fight it out. Well, that was after. So, mm -hmm. so, but he would let them build their own cells. They choose okay. the queens, and and okay. to, and then he had another experiment about uh, subsequent, you know, reswarming. He after the first one emerged, he'd just open them all up, and the bees would take care of. Uh, you know, all the excess queens and leave the best queen. But initially he was saying that bees will decide which are the better eggs to move forward as a queen. Whereas when we graft, we're, we don't know. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, here's what I would say to that. Uh, several points. One is, you know, it depends if you're, if you're talking about swarming, reproductive swarming. So not emergency queen cells. Like if you kill the queen, then, okay, then in that case, they are selecting, let's say, some age appropriate larva to try to make an emergency queen cell. But in the other case, okay, so we're not talking about that, right? You're talking about normal swarming. He lets them make swarm cells and all that. Well, they make these swarm cells. They don't move eggs around. The queen goes into that swarm cell and lays an egg. Right, and that becomes then. I mean, okay. They, no, no. They I'm talking about. Part. I'm talking about. I guess something happens to the queen, right? We take it away, or she gets smushed, or whatever. Uh, um, they need to decide. You're talking about emergency queen cells. I suppose there's a difference. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah. She, well, well yeah. She lays an egg, so she makes the choice, right? Yeah. In, in so a, in a supersedure. Yeah, yeah. So w when they're swarming, you know, the 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 workers make those special cells, and then the queen, let's just say, either vert, you know, on purpose or inadvertently, goes and lays eggs in them, and now they're positioned properly that they're going to raise a queen out of them. So I guess there could be they could decide, oh, we don't like you, and they don't raise a queen out, and they eat it or something. But I don't know that there's evidence of that. So. In in that situation, um, uh, you know they they are probably getting fed better and all that stuff. The emergency queen cell thing, I think we have another problem because um, uh, you know from day um, you know up to about forty eight hours, they can the larva is they can make a new queen out of it, right? Doolittle in his book, that eighteen eighty eight book, Scientific Queen Rearing. He, he believed that you should graft two-day-old larvae because he thought they were stronger. Now, most people feel that you should graft one-day-old larvae because um, they're fed longer as a queen and you get bigger and better queens out of them. Um, the, I, so I, but I think the problem with an emergency queen cell, if, if what you're talking about is that you remove the queen from a colony and they're queenless, and now they have to choose from one of those larvae that's in a worker cell, and they have to make a queen out of her. I mean, that is a way to do it, kind of a primitive way to, you know, you just split a colony and one half of them is going to make queens and the other half has a queen right i mean that was one of the early ways to to make queens right the and and i guess i i i don't have evidence 
but you know one of the arguments against that is um, that you know the, the, there can be a whole range of, of larval ages and that is an emergency situation there you know they maybe they uh, maybe they feed say 10 or 15 larvae and, and, one, and one or two of them are old. They're old enough to quote be a queen but now they, they haven't been fed as a queen as much as might, they might normally be, say, in a, a swarm cell or like if you grafted one, a one-day-old larva, and put it into a big queenless colony with a bunch of nurse bees, they're going to begin feeding that right away as a queen. And so then you have this range of queens that are going to come out. The first ones that come out may be the ones that were physiologically kind of old you know, still young enough to make a queen, but maybe not ideal. And then they could come out and still kill the other ones and take over. So <clears throat> I don't know. I would, I would have to, you know, ruminate on that or talk to that person a little bit more. One well, thing think... about worm cells, that when I was an uh, undergraduate at the University of Georgia, my, the guy that taught me beekeeping was this guy named Al Dietz. He was a German guy. But... Um, I, I, the, the uh, bee inspector from Florida uh, came up and, and he, he had been, he was some old commercial guy that, you know, became a bee inspector as he got older. Uh, and he, he, I won't say he beat it into me, but I've never forgotten. He hated the idea of, of using queens uh, from swarm cells. Like if you go into a colony, you've got these beautiful cells you know, they, they, I mean, they're going to be beautiful queens. But his feeling was when you do that, you are selecting for swarming behavior. And, you know, as a beekeeper, he felt that we should not select for swarming behavior. And so, because, I mean, and of course, I've never, I mean, I don't always follow that, but um, in general, I, don't usually save swarm cells. Uh, if it for I'm, I'm lying because if it's something that I really like genetically and I get these beautiful swarm cells, I'm going to put them all in nukes and stuff. But but normally, uh, if you had a breeding program, a long term breeding program where all you did was use swarm cells, you would probably select for bees that were pretty swarmy. A couple of things uh, stuck with me from Walt's program. Uh, one of them was that he noticed uh, or had uh, scientific uh, tests that confirmed that uh, drones that were uh, too late in the season were already infected with Nisema and they would infect the queens. So he uh, preferred to get the, the queens that were produced uh, early in the season because they would then not be infected with nosema. The second okay. thing was uh, related to uh, Sue's question. Um, the strategy, I think, were, was twofold. One was to, when, when the first queen emerged, uh, he would open up all of the other queen cells so that the instead of doing after swarms, the colony would select a queen out of all of those available queens. And then um, that would be uh, the best queen for one. And it would prevent the colony from swarming again because they just didn't know after swarms because there were no hidden queens uh, to produce additional swarms from. They wouldn't boot out the, the virgin queen that was there uh, just so that they could produce another swarm from another queen. Now, what did he do with that first queen? You said after the first when queen emerged. The, the first queen would hatch out. He would observe that the first queen had hatched out, maybe see her in the hive, and then go and uncap all of the rest of the queen cells and let all of those queens emerge. Oh, okay. Because the bees, the bees would, would otherwise be keeping some of those queens confined, and then they'd force that first queen out with a, a primary swarm or secondary swarm, and then there would be other tertiary swarms from the queens that had not yet emerged. So he was forcing the issue and forcing the colony to select the best from all of the okay, queens yeah. that were popped yeah. out. So, yeah, so he didn't say, oh, I have this one queen is out, I'll just 
destroy all these other queen cells, he carefully would open them and let them exactly come out if they were old enough. Right. Yeah, I don't see a problem with that if you're gonna. I mean, if you're gonna de- if you're gonna have that swarming, you know, if you're gonna let that colony be headed by that uh, swarm cell, then sure. Uh, he was counting on the uh, the bees being able to sense by whatever mechanisms, odors, uh, pheromones, uh, behavior, which one was the best one to allow to survive. Mm -hmm. But what about the queen's behavior themselves to like try to kill each other? You you, you (laughs) just say, let it go, okay? Yeah, (laughs) WWF. So, you know, the the uh, the gland that uh, stimulates queens to kill each other, I guess, is uh, I think it's one of those abdominal uh, sclerites, you know, right like right behind the thorax on the abdomen. And um, there was a graduate student of um, Nico and Gudrun Kerniger. I don't know if you know the Kernigers. They, I think they're retired, but they were kind of. She was a specialist in. Uh, um, um, mating, like like in uh, the structure, you know, endophallus structure of, of different apis species, actually, in the end, they did a lot of work in Borneo and everything, but they had a student that was working on queen fighting, and so they would dissect out, they, they had basically little jackets made from that part of the, the queen's exoskeleton, that they would then put on different, put on drones and, you know, they, they did some really bizarre, like little arena fighting things with, with queens to see how they fought and what stimulated them to fight. Were there octagons involved? Yeah, I, I think they were maybe like clear plastic solo cups or something, or the German equivalent of solo cups. They were arenas. They're called arenas, technically. <laughs> Thunderdome. I don't know. Do you know anyone who has the German bees in the United States? Uh, yeah, I, I really don't. I mean, we have the semen in the liquid nitrogen tank. Certainly when I was younger, when I was in graduate school, I, I um, I collected about 700 feral colonies of honeybees. And some of these were not really feral. They were from, uh, there was a, a blind beekeeper in Tennessee. And the, the bees that they had, you know, based on the genetic markers, mitochondrial DNA and uh, later microsatellites, there was a pretty sizable influence of those black bees still around. So, um, you know, you could find them uh, back then. There, were, there was no one specifically selling them that I knew, but, but certainly the kind of feral bees in the mountains in Georgia and some of these places. Um, I think also in, uh, from the feral colonies that we collected in Arizona, some of these caves in Arizona, this is before Africanized bees were there. The about seventy percent of the feral colonies in Arizona, for example, had the mitochondrial DNA of the black bee, Apis mellifera mellifera, which was also the bee you know brought into Mexico by the Spaniards. So, the, so ge- there were genetic like fingerprints or signatures of them still around, but I don't know anymore uh, because. Um, it's, there's no one I know that's really doing a lot of work with feral colonies. Most folks just figured they were kind of lost. Although, you know, Tom Seeley is doing that work in, in uh, New York State. And a former student of mine, Debbie Delaney, is in Delaware. And she did some work in the East, uh, still trying to collect feral colonies and look at them with uh, genetic markers. But uh, I don't know anyone who's actively keeping them or, or trying, to, trying to keep them here. Um, 
Yeah. Matt, do you? I mean, I mean, have you guys heard of it? No. No. Oh, there was a, a talk last night. A woman said she worked in Hawaii, and there were some there. She didn't like them. But I yeah. haven't run across any yet. No, was, was that was it? Was that is that the uh, the new uh, the new um, sort of extension entomologist person in Hawaii that working with bees? <coughs> but, but well, because um, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. She gave a talk in our department a little more than a week ago, I think. But um, so, you know, in, in Hawaii, they're, they're one of the larger producers of carniolans, uh, Kona Queen is. Um, but she reported the same thing, that there were some, lo some local people who talked about that they were, they were getting these black bees and, and they believed that they were uh, like Apis mellifera mellifera, you know, that had originally been there. So there could be some of those on, on those islands. You know, when I, my, the, my graduate work for my master's was with a guy named Albert Jaycox. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember him, but he was originally from California and Arizona. And he talked about these, these mountain valleys in uh, Colorado that back then, that would have been in the mid eighties. Supposedly there were still Caucasian type bees living in the mountains there. And if you go back in historical records, one of the big importers of Caucasians uh, was a group, these Rauchfuss brothers. And I think they may have settled in Colorado. So that would have made some sense historically. But, um, but yeah, but I, I don't know that the uh, mitochondrial DNA of Apis mellifera mellifera is pretty distinctive. So that's why it was kind of easy to find. The one other thing, out of 703 samples, I think, we found 12 samples from places as diverse North Carolina to caves in Texas. 12 samples had mitochondrial DNA of that honeybee uh, Apis mellifera lamarckii from the Nile River Valley. And that was introduced in the U.S. in 1867. You know, the, the bees themselves now would have been probably, you know, Italian type bees, but the mitochondrial DNA is only maternally inherited. So even though they could have made it with generations of other things, and as far as their behavior or appearance, they would be like the other things, you could still see that uh, genetic, that genetic background from the maternal side. And, and, that, and that's 2%. I think 12 out of 700 is close to 2%. Okay. I have a, one question. That is, a, yeah. uh, you uh, were traveling abroad to collecting all the samples on the uh, so forth. I was wondering how were the uh, mites infestation and what are the methods they used to treat as mites? Great question. So, um, the, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, people are having, I, I, I'll specifically talk about Europe and uh, in Asia, you know, Western, Central Asia, anyway. Uh, in, in, in Brazil, they were treating for mites. In uh, um, places I've been in Africa, they weren't treating for mites. In, in Egypt, in that Lamarckii area, Weirdly, uh, sometimes they were treating for mites, but I don't think they really had them. And then the, the weirdest thing of all in some of those would, uh, they, they would have uh, like uh, religious iconography kind of stuff in some of the hives. And they said it was to make them do things better. But, uh, but in certainly in the former Soviet, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, they, uh, they were mainly using this stuff they called BPEN, which is basically amitraz, liquid amitraz. And they would get it in these glass vials and they would put it in a spray bottle with water and they would not use gloves. And then they would uh, 
one guy would hold the frame and the other guy would spray the beads with it. Uh, so they were using uh, Amitraz. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, in, in Europe, it's, I mean, like, you know, the like Italy and places like, like that, they're, I mean, they're use, they were using various uh, products early on, Fluvalinate, and, and later, um, Perazine, which is uh, like Kumafos, but a liquid form they only used in the winter and, and, and only in broodless situations. And then, you know, they were using a lot of oxalic acid and uh, they used thymol a lot in Malta, but, it, you know, thymol, you know, the uh, thymol would cause the queen to stop laying. And then the problem with certain strains of bees is if you make the, even though the queen is only temporarily not laying, uh, they'll then replace her because she's not laying. One of the, but one of the coolest things that they're doing in, um, there is some drone tracking, you know, uh, cutting your frame in a way that you can cut out the drone brood and feed it to your chickens or do that. But one of the, the, one of the things that they do a lot in Italy is uh, during a certain time of the year, usually when there's a dearth period, like in August, you know, when they're going on vacation, they, uh, they have these special cages that are uh, maybe three three inches by four inches, and they're the thickness of a frame, and they have queen excluder material uh, for the outside. They put the queen in there in sometime in August during the time when there's not much food coming in, and the queen's kind of shutting down anyway, and they leave her in there for. 20 days or so that way all the brood emerges and they also don't replace her because they can go in there and they can lick her and and i don't know maybe she even is you know i don't know if she's laying eggs and they're take, take, eating the eggs or whatever but they don't usually try to replace her and then they let her out and they treat it treat the colonies with oxalic acid or some relatively mild miticide it is very effective because they have no brood. So, you know, like um, an oxalic acid dribble works really well if you have no brood. Or one thing that we use now uh, ourselves is hop guard. And it also works really well if there's no brood. So the secret is no brood. Is there so a hop guard two or three? I'm sorry, is there a hop guard two? or three, or just a general hop guard? Yeah, yeah, well, the newest one now is hop guard three, right? Which I, yeah. uh, according, I mean, we haven't given it a very good test, but uh, Rodrigo, uh, uh, our uh, apiary manager, who's actually now working with his brother and they have about 1500 hives and he, uh, He's now down in California, you know, he's, he's gone on to greener pastures, but he said that the newer HopGuard, the HopGuard 3, uh, he thinks it does last longer. Uh, you know, it, it's more effective, but, but, but I wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't count on any of those things to work if you have brood. But um, I mean, we've, you know, we've, it's been a very uh, early, early on, we used, uh, Epistan, I guess, like 15 years ago, we, we did use that. Uh, actually, the, my, the Kernigers, Nico and Gudrun Kerniger, they did some of the early work in Germany on Apistan or Fluvalinate, you know, that pyrethroid. And what they did and what they, do, they were doing in Austria at the time was uh, they, um, they would use the strips, the beekeepers would all use them at exactly the same you know, 10 day or, or whatever, 50 day period, 35 day period. And then they would put them in a can and use them the next year. Nico was doing the original work for Bayer, testing some of this. And he found that the amount that was needed to actually control the mites was much, much smaller than the 10% that they put in those strips. Uh, and the company said, oh, well, it's only pennies a strip to have this amount. So we're gonna put this amount in. But the amount that was actually required was much less. 
but you know, people began using uh, Maverick, you know, the uh, fl the fluvalinate cattle dip on uh, wooden uh, tongue depressor strips. And within uh, just a few years, uh, the mites became resistant to that. Fairly mild pyrethroid insecticide, sadly. Uh, and then, you know, <laughs> that happened much faster here in the US because we already, you know, bee coopers already knew about the the wooden tongue depressor trick. And uh, the guys in, where I saw this mostly was in Spain. We were collecting in Spain. And uh, one, we went to a extracting plant of a kind of a cooperative. And one person's full-time job was just to pull the wooden tongue depressors out of the frames of honey, if there were tongue depressors in the honey. So they were extracting all that stuff. And then they gave us a jar of honey as we left. And you know, we, we left it in the hotel room. But uh, yeah, it was well, just a real shame, really. The, the, uh, you know, the, it was such a short-sighted uh, loss of that material because you know, you know, it was, and then they, you know, they went on to other kind of horrible things. But um, yeah, so in, uh, I, I would go with the uh, trying to, the queen caging thing. If if you're not a commercial person with thousands of colonies, we, we've we've done some of that ourselves. Uh, or or if you just have a way, you're splitting up colonies, you're doing things, and you can uh, make things up without a brood, without sealed brood. You can then uh, treat them with oxalic acid and get good control. If you buy packages and treat them right away with something like oxalic acid or, or um, hop guard. Hop guard, for those of you that don't know it, is, know it is, is hop beta acids made from hops, you know, the same stuff that's beer. Uh, but, um, and it, it's fair, I mean, I, I think you can actually eat it if you wanted to, but it's, it's not very, doesn't smell very good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, okay, but one, you know, the one, one other two. thing also with, with the uh, indoor wintering. So we, Brandon's been work, doing a good bit of work of putting bees in uh, apple uh, storage um, uh, warehouses for, for a few weeks before going down to California. And they come out of that with no brood. So you know, whenever you have opportunities to make your colony broodless, which you may have a harder time down in California, I realize. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one quick question, when uh, you brought up the amateurs, and uh, yeah. as, as we know, uh, APVAR is uh, based on amateurs. Now, every single one of them that I talk to, anybody says uh, uh, APVAR, when you use it, no honey super on. That is like a, a, a rule. Now, my question is to you is that, do you have any experience of the uh, how much of a trace of amateurs on that honey super in the honey? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm certain that the label says not to use it when you, when you have honey supers on. Uh, right. know, I, would, I, I would not follow, I would not uh, mess with that rule uh, because, you know, there, we know, I mean, we've talked to beekeepers commercial beekeepers who have had loads of honey, uh, you know, tested and rejected. Unfortunately, they usually go and sell it to someone else, but I wouldn't do it. Uh, I, I mean, so I, you know, it is true that all of these pests, things like Amitraz and even uh, Kumafos or Fluvalinate, they're much more, they much more easily get into wax or, or you know, uh, uh, lipids than they do into aqueous solution. So even if you have uh, contaminated wax, the amount that gets in the honey is usually low, but who would want, you know, I, I wouldn't want to keep bees or eat honey if I had to, to do that stuff, you yeah. know. So uh, basically, you do not. Uh, I'm just asking: Was there any uh, study done, any uh, scientific data collected off of, in, except the manufacturer recommended? 
Yeah, yeah, I believe there are. There, there's some there, there's some work done by Jeff Pettis when he was at the USDA. Um, and it mainly, a lot of this was about um, rearing queens. You know, if you have a certain amount of these different things in the wax, how it affects the queens. But I believe there, there, there are studies showing the difference in the, the tendency of these pesticides to go into wax versus going into honey. So it's, it, it, you know, I think for you to detect, for you to have it in the honey, it was probably in a pretty high dose in the wax, you know. So the problem is, if um, you know, if you're not using separate. So, for example, when we started here, you know, I was much younger and you know, and was stupid. Uh, you know, I just kept everything in deep. So we had deep honey supers and we had deep brood boxes and. Uh, and in that case, you know, you have the chance for brood combs to be used in the in the uh, in the honey supers. But now we use westerns for the for honey and in deeps for the brood boxes, so we don't have that issue. Yeah. I would just be really careful. But it, I mean, if you want, uh, there's definitely studies on that. There, you know, on yeah. that. I mean, I've read the several studies. I just asked, you know, whether you had your personal experience of any study done at your um, uh, community, but I, oh, I, that's yeah. why I just asked. Uh, yes, sir, not, not me. Although uh, my student, uh, a student of mine, Judy Wu, who's now at Nebraska, uh, her master's work here was looking um, right after, uh, when was it? You know, right after so-called CCD at we got combs from uh, the USDA from colonies that supposedly died of CCD. And we did a bunch of, well, we did some studies. Uh, use, and so we sent these combs off for analysis. We sent all kinds of combs off for analysis and found various sorts of pesticides. And then we, we forced queens to lay eggs on combs from CCD colonies that had high pesticide loads and relatively clean combs and then we followed the progeny and what you found was uh, abnormalities in the in the larval development and you found an average reduction of in lifespan of uh, I think four days uh, if you reared them out and then kept them in cages so rearing the bees in combs that were that had high pesticide loads uh, did have a significant toll on the uh, survival of the of the larvae and one of the things you know it hasn't really been followed up on but where that comes into play is um, you know uh, as of as a forager the average lifespan of a worker is about nine days. So during the summer, even though they can live, say, four to six weeks, once they start foraging, it's like two to 19 days with an average of it being about eight or nine days. So if you're reducing the lifespan of that, of say, a forager by four days, let's say now they're living five days, the colony has the plasticity to force workers that are not physiologically old enough, not ready to become foragers, right? Because the colony needs the food. So you're going to do that. And that cascades all the way back through the age-based division of labor, all the way back to the nurse bees. And the critical factor in the colony demographics uh, for the population growth of a colony is the number of larvae that a nurse bee feeds in her lifetime. And if you're taking those nurse bees out of their job a day or two early to go into some other job, uh, that could cause the population to decline. So that was kind of her uh, hypothesis, possibly of why these sublethal but harmful levels of pesticides in, in brood wax could lead to colony decline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
right. I'm, I'm you. not. Would you say that those pesticides are like, you know, they're, they're like in Roundup, it's the glyphosates that are, um, they are supposedly not restricted for bees is what we're, what people say right. that want to use them. But I, you know, there's some research that's out there that says that it really messes with the gut microflora and um, also disturbs their um, their orientation, um, so they become disoriented and and maybe don't do the behaviors that they normally would. Is that the category of pesticide that you're thinking of? Or it's really a well, well, actually, in in <laughs> these these this analysis these analyses, there were I think there was a big suite of of 70 or 80 pesticides that were looked at. So in all cases, the, the so-called so high pesticide wax, it had multiple fungicides, you know, herbicides and pesticides uh, in it. Okay, they didn't. Uh, so we couldn't tease out, we couldn't tease out what was what. Mm -hmm. She's, she went on to do her PhD with Marla Spivak mainly focusing on uh, neonicotinoids. Mm -hmm. And one thing that uh, I just talked to her on Sunday, uh, and, uh, let me get back to that. But uh, you know, the neonicotinoids are the ones that's been shown that in fairly low so-called sublethal doses, they cause the bees to become disoriented. So they, if you feed them a little bit of this stuff, they'll like, instead of going back to the hive, they'll just fly off somewhere and come back the next day or, or hours later, they don't really know where they go. So that there's a pretty cool study on that where they they're they're feeding them sugar syrup and they know that it takes you know five minutes to go to the hive and come back to the feeder. They're all trained. And then they replace it with a feeder with a really low dose of uh, neonicotinoid. And then those bees uh, just fly off all over the place and maybe come back the next day. So, hmm. so it disrupts their, their, their foraging behavior. One of the things going on uh, in Nebraska, so uh, Judy was having tremendous, she is having tremendous trouble with her colonies dying. And right next to the farm, the, the farm, their University of Nebraska farm is a big plant that uh, digests uh, uh, waste uh, seed, like corn seed that didn't get planted and all that. Uh, it, they, uh, they would digest this and uh, it's an ethanol plant. They would make ethanol, I think, out of it. Oh. And it turns out that there's this loophole, like an EPA loophole. And what they were getting mostly was corn and maybe wheat seed, you know, that was treated with neonicotinoids uh, but seed that's been treated with neonicotinoids is not the same as plants that are treated with it. So they were, this one plant is getting something like 85% of the waste seed in the country and they're making ethanol out of it. But then the sludge from that was running into the nearby stream and basically uh, the parts per billion were really amazingly high. And so uh, a few weeks ago, you know, with a lot of political pressure and a lot of uh, newspaper articles, uh, the plant was shut down. And then three days later, last week, they mysteriously had a giant leak that leaked tons of this stuff into that stream that goes out to the Platte River. And uh, so if you guys get a chance and you just want to see horrific things or hear about some weird stuff going on, look up like Nebraska, you know, you can probably look it up by her name, Judy Wu, or look up, you know, ethanol, coal, ethanol plant, neonicotinoid waste, and you'll get into that current thing but uh, she's been you know she would I put her in touch with our toxicologist here at WSU and uh, it's kind of a bunch of really bad shenanigans going on and no one really takes responsibility for it it's a bad thing because uh, what are you going to do with all those that neonicotinoid treated seed well what they've been doing is making alcohol out of it 
but the pesticide doesn't go away. It's in that waste that then doesn't have to be treated as any kind of pesticide waste because it's spent um, ethanol must. So anyway, yeah. sorry. Yeah. But anyway, been that's this for a little bit desperate. Yeah. You've been at this for over two hours now. Um, I know, I better- enjoyed uh, every minute. Thank oh, you thank so much. Thank you guys. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, it was a pleasure, I, you know. Uh, like like maybe, George Bush, you are, you're the, 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 bee, the bee researcher. It would be most wonderful to have a beer with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was, this was water, but this is wine. <laughs> <laughs> Here's all of you guys. Cheers. Jerry, Thanks so you, much. Thanks did, very much. Did you, you ask him, you. Did, could we you. record this? We are recording yeah, it. You, and you we appreciate it. very much that you okay. uh, let us yes, do it. You might, yeah, you might. If I said bad things, cut that stuff out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Thank you so much. Yeah. And the, the researcher doing that work on the Drosophila, his name is William Rice. The other thing that he's semi famous for is going to Japan and buying all this uh, hand uh, fish and tuna and stuff that really turned out to be whale. But, you know, oh. the whales are only being killed for research, right? But right. mysteriously, they're in all this canned fish products in Japan. Because oh. so, he did the DNA work, right? <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, anyway. Very amazing. Okay, Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, Thank have you. a good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Jerry. We we had a lot of diehards that uh, stuck it out uh, yeah. all the way through. Yeah, started, started, yeah I, I kept a lot of you up too late. We we <laughs> started out with like 35 or so, and there were 29 still uh, just a few minutes ago. Okay. Bye. We have hybrid, hybrid school, so it's okay. Going right to you guys. <laughs> Take care. Thanks so much. Adios. Yeah. We'll be in touch. Thank you.